Good morning. And now for something a little different. Um, we do a lot of things differently in the forum. We take communion every week and we dip instead of the little pieces of bread. Um, you know, we have this small room and um, we have snacks all over the place while we're having our message and worship and everything. Um, but the main thing that makes us different, the thing that gives us the name The Forum, is that when we get together for our message teaching time, um, it's, it's interactive. It's, it's a discussion. It's a conversation. Um, and so, um, you know, as much as our music, we do a couple different songs, but not really all that different from you, you know. We, we take communion with grape juice and, and bread, just like you. A lot of the things are, are, are very, very similar. Um, but this is the defining feature, uh, because there are a lot of people that, um, that got the impression from sermons that, that, that they were being told what to think. And if you've heard many of Pastor Mark's sermons, you know that's not the case. But they have the impression, and we need to respond to that. And, that that's, and that's what we're doing at the Forum, is responding to that by creating a place where people can be in dialogue about their faith in a way that's comfortable, that's not confrontational, that's not... Um, you know, where it doesn't feel like we're trying to force anything down their throats. Instead, we open up scripture, we open up conversation. Um, so I'm Cullen, in case you don't know me. I'm the youth director here, and I play some music. And, um, and so, um, and this is... Hi, Rachel is my name. Uh, and another thing we do is we usually have two people talking, so then it's more conversational. And often one of them knows a whole bunch about the Bible. <laughs> and <laughs> theological stuff, and then there's another person. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm mostly just here because I'm the least shy. So, <laughs> hi, good morning. <laughs> so, um, we're going to begin our conversation time with the reading of Scripture. So, Stephen, Stephen. it's you, man. Woo! We had another Scripture reader lined up for this morning, and she called at... Um, five minutes to eight and said she had pink eye. And so that's oh. a problem. A gross problem. Good morning. Uh, the first scripture is Genesis 2, 4 through 9. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thanks, Stephen. So, from what Stephen just read, um, apparently we are made of dirt. Congratulations. Um, God looked around Eden and saw that there wasn't anyone to work in the garden. So God puts some dirt in a pile, and he blows on it, and he makes humanity. Um, and when I say it like that, it sounds pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, think about it. Step away from it as, as, as a story that you've been hearing since day one of Sunday school. Think, okay, God, who can do anything he wants to, can't keep up with his own garden. Um, but, but that's the story that we're given. Now, of course, on a certain level, the meaning of this scripture is simple. It's an explanation of how God made Adam. But God could have made Adam in any way he wanted. Just a few verses ago, God finished making the whole universe and everything out of nothing. And now, God needs to play in the dirt to make Adam. So for some reason, God, I'm going to assume God has a good reason for everything God does. Is that a safe assumption? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to guess that God makes Adam out of dirt for a reason that we should work to discover. So that's what we're going to do together. We're going to talk about why God chose to make us out of dirt and breath when he could have made us out of anything or nothing at all. 
So let's start with dirt. Um, why dirt? Why dirt? That's a strange thing. What's significant about dirt, about the ground that we live on, that God would form little dirt people and blow on them? A lot of things can grow from dirt. That's excellent. You know, and, and like the song we just sang, you know, life is springing up from this old ground. You know, uh, if, if I'm a dirt man, it, it means that I am worth very little unto myself. Um, one possible understanding of this passage is that because we are made from the earth, we are made for the earth. And that's explicit right there. God says, someone's got to take care of this garden. Someone's got to take care of this earth I've made. And so he makes Adam for this purpose. There's a clear purpose behind the making of Adam. And so, since God, Adam's going to take care of the earth, he makes him out of the earth. We are made from the earth for the earth. Um, and not only does the earth belong to us, because we're given authority over it, in just a few verses before where Stephen started in Genesis 1.28, but we belong to the earth, too. Because we are made from the stuff of the earth, the earth isn't made from our stuff. So we belong to the earth in a very real way, too. And so when we hurt the earth, we hurt ourselves. Because we're made from the same thing. Because we share a common origin. Any, uh, any other thoughts from anyone about... Um, what, what God was thinking when he made us out of mud. We got Jim in the back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, when I heard we were talking about dirt today, I started thinking about that and us being made out of dirt. And I thought first that I should probably go easier on my super slobby husband who's <laughs> always uh, dirtying up my home and then I clean up after him love you <laughs> and um, then I was thinking about uh, I have this three-year-old son you might have seen him running around here named Bennett and I get this paper from his daycare every day and it says what he ate and other details you know nap and other things that kids do and he uh, on the snack, it said, uh, for snack today, it was dirt. And I said, I said, honey, what in the world? You ate dirt for snack? And his whole face lit up. And no, mommy, no, no, no. My teacher took pudding, and she crushed up some cookies, and she put some gummy worms in it. And that's what we had for snack, and it was so yummy, mommy. And he was really pumped about that. And I thought, oh, that's sweet. And I thought of that when we were talking about dirt. And then uh, I took Bennett outside to play. And he said, Mommy, where's my shovel? And I said, here you go, go play. And sure enough, he was just <laughs> shoveling the dirt into his mouth. And he's like, it's not exactly the same, but, you know, it's, it's a good snack. And I thought, um, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to tell you guys about uh, how dirt is nothing on its own. It's worthless, lifeless, disgusting. And so I thought of that story because when it's pouring out of every orifice of your child's face and you're trying to clean them up, it's, you really understand how gross dirt is. Some moms are nodding. Yeah, <laughs> it was disgusting. But anyway, um, so there's this whole idea of dirt being nothing without us coming along and putting something in it. Like Pam said, you can grow a lot out of dirt, but in and of itself, it's nothing, right? And so um, we kind of thought about God coming along and putting that breath into the dirt as um, such a big deal, like a bigger deal, I think, than I've thought about before, you know, that, that I would be absolutely nothing unless he had breathed on me, and um, we're also going to talk about a, how he continues to breathe on us, but this idea that we depend on God for everything because our life exists because of his decision that he would breathe on us. Um, and then also, uh, if you think about God's breath being everything that we can live off of, on the flip side of that, if we don't have God, 
if we don't have him breathing on us, we don't have a life. And so we're all here existing because he made that decision. And that's kind of cool, I think. Yeah, the breath side of this equation is, is, is so interesting. Why did God choose breath then? Because God could have just, you know, snapped his fingers and, and the dirt sprang to life like Pinocchio or something like that. But instead, mm -hmm. God uses breath as his implement to animate us into being. But something really interesting that, that I, I, I found out about breath is, is that it's, it's this constant reminder. It's this thing that we are doing every day, um, every moment. And when, when from the moment you're born, you know, your new life has begun when you take that first breath and acknowledge the gift of life from your Creator. And e even while you sleep, you're taking that gift in and out of your lungs. Even people, uh, when they're denying that God exists, saying, I don't believe in God, they're having the gift of God pass over their lips and their teeth. And with our last breath, when we can no longer, with this physical body, confess that presence of God and that miracle, that gift of life anymore, that's when we pass on. 